President Biden taking a bit of a victory lap, but one year after signing that Inflation Reduction and in Chips and Sciences Act into law, the president traveling across the country touting his administration's accomplishments. It's called Bidenomics. Someone who helped uh, enact the Bidenomics program is at our table. Brian Deese, uh, good morning to you. It's good to see you. So here's, here's the thing that I, and I'm just going to go straight to it. There's a lot of good that I think has come out of this, I think. However, for reasons that I, are inexplicable to me, if you look at the polls, we have a presidential election coming. For, there's a huge swath of, of Americans who are not prepared, A, to vote for President Biden again, but B, even polled on their view of the economy, they don't think it's very good. What do you make of that? Well, let's start with the economics and then go to the politics. On the economics, in a year, we've seen the most significant economic response to any piece of legislation in 70 years. We've seen a doubling of manufacturing construction, and under the hood, you see that in semiconductors, but you also see that in clean energy, announced projects, multiples of what we've ever seen in this country before. And that holds the prospect for driving productivity, for driving better job opportunities in the future, um, and for meeting our climate goals out of the gate very strong. So then you go to the politics and say, well, why is this not immediately translating? Look, people have a lot of theories. I go, go to sort of the most simple and basic, which is people are rational and they see something that's good news and they ask themselves, no, oh, that's good. Is that going to sustain across time? And so economists like to say, you know, sentiment operates with a lag. I think what that means is people are rational and they want to see is the good news going to translate into long-standing good news for their communities? You know, I was down in that TSMC facility uh, in, the, uh, in the Phoenix region, and you have in that region now semiconductor facilities, battery facilities, creating a bit of a hub in that space. That has the potential to change the trajectory for so many families in that region. But I think they legitimately are going to ask, is this going to be here a year, two, three, four? So it's going to take some time. So that's actually very interesting. If we were to actually go to the areas that should benefit from this the most. Yeah. It's actually even, even worse, I imagine, if you look at some of these states and, and you look at the people in those, in those regions, do they say to themselves, I'm a Biden voter as a function of this? No, I think, it's, so I think it's the opposite in the following sense, which is the closer you get to the ground level, the more concrete and tangible this becomes. And this is why I think to understand the impact of this, these three pieces of legislation, including infrastructure, you have to use a map. You have to go very specifically to these specific places. And that's why we're also seeing the sort of strange politics of Republicans claiming credit or not denying credit when there's actually a facility that's being built in their district. Because at the very local level, these things become less particle, uh, partisan political right. and more practical. So the question is, does that aggregate up and does that aggregate to a national story that people who may not have themselves or a kid who's interested in going into the semiconductor industry, do they understand that it's part of a broader national right. trend? Do you think all of this is inflationary? Uh, no, because I, part of the part of the story, and I think yeah. why, to the extent that Americans feel feel what they feel about the economy, yeah. it's an inflation story. It's it's that their wages have not, you know, tracked and 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 caught up to how much things cost. Yeah. So, I, in terms of consumer sentiment, I think that a lot of this is about inflation, and a lot of it is about what has been so unique about this economy. Everything about this economy has been out of sample for the last two or three years, including the run up in inflation. And again, to go to the most simple explanation, when real wages are falling, people feel like they can buy less and they also feel uncertainty in their lives. We know that that's what inflation does. For the last year, we've seen that flip. And I think some, a lot of what people missed in the resilience story and in the, you know, the improvement in the economic outlook is that real wages have now for several months been running positive and that changes people's sentiment. We're starting to see that in the sentiment data. You should start to see that run through. I think these investment packages, this industrial strategy, is about something bigger. It's about changing structurally right. productivity trends in the country, changing our capacity in the country. That is a long needed and potentially really positive economic story. The politics of it, you know, we'll have to see. But ultimately, I mean, when, when the Fed talks about a 2% inflation target, if we're structurally changing the way our economy is, is built by reshoring, shouldn't that, that inflation target just naturally be higher? Because it does cost more money to make a chip on U.S. ground as opposed to in Taiwan or, or elsewhere. Yeah. Look, I think that that may be where we're headed over the, uh, over the medium term. But 
you know, for on this show and many of us yep. and many of you, in the last decade, we spent most of our time worried about this issue of secular stagnation, that actually we were going to operate below our productive capacity for structural reasons. And I think that this investment campaign has the potential to change that structurally. That means that you would operate in a higher growth, higher wage, mm -hmm. um, higher rate environment. And, uh, higher inflation environment. Uh, it, but, but to do so in a way that you get to a stable equilibrium that actually produces better real wage outcomes for Americans and higher productivity uh, growth over the long term. That's within sight now. Uh, right. Obviously, this trans everything about this transition is unique, but that's within sight. Do you feel like the Inflation Reduction Act was named appropriately? <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was announced, it was passed when yeah. inflation had peaked, yeah. basically. Yeah. So it's not because of the Inflation Reduction Act that we saw inflation come down. It was a lot of other forces going on. It may still bring inflation down in the future. But do you think that was the right thing to call it, given what it's... You're, you're saying it's promising growth. Yeah. Jobs, you know, all these other right. things. Yeah. I, look, I think that uh, I think that there's a lot of creativity that goes into uh, naming pieces of legislation. What I would say on this front, though, is and, and on the one year anniversary, we, we're talking a lot about fiscal issues, too. One of the things about the Inflation Reduction Act that we talk less about, we talk about investment in clean energy and this, you know, industrial uh, strategy. It was also a valuable model for how to address our fiscal issues, because it was about investing and cutting the deficit. And we all know that cutting the deficit in our political environment right now is very difficult. Right. IRA provides a model to do that, how, invest in some areas, but also reduce the deficit. How concerned are you, or do you say to yourself, this is going to be success, that, that the clean energy programs that have been put in place are being used, the uptake on those programs are being used at multiples, I think, most of the expectations of what people ever anticipated, in which case there's going to be a lot more subsidies and a lot more things uh, that had not been put into the, baked into the original cake. So when we go look at these numbers five, ten years from now, I, I don't know. Do you say this is great success and it looks more attractive? Or are you going to say, actually, this cost us a small fortune and what did we get for it? Yeah, it's a great question. It goes to the fundamental of the economic response we've seen, right? At core, this is about private sector investment. And that's what's unique about these three sets of bills is they've accomplished something that government policy doesn't always accomplish, which is to provide enough long-term certainty that private capital is now putting itself at risk to build and scale in areas that they haven't before. I think overwhelmingly that is very positive. And the biggest risk we have to the, to the segment before about workforce or permitting or otherwise is that we don't follow through on the other necessary elements to actually allow that investment to happen and to provide the economic benefits. I think that's the bigger risk. Of course, you want to pay attention to the fiscal side, but this goes to the structure of the Inflation Reduction Act. It had a dollar, $2 of deficit reduction for every dollar of investment. So even if you take the, the higher estimates, right. by the end of the decade, you're still just that bill alone is still generating $40, $50 billion of deficit reduction a year. So you want to keep your eye on it. But overall, the more economic response we can have in terms of durable private investment in potentially high productivity areas of our economy, that's a, that's a very good thing. Okay.